Tales from the Parallel Part 3 The Montauk Timeline Engineers Do we live in an engineered reality? In 1999, an individual by the name of Professor Fate shared what he claimed to be the truth about our world line, in which we are the unsuspecting players of a hidden reality war that could one day doom us all. The basic premise is this, there are those who believe that individuals working on the Montauk project have discovered the ability to time travel, and have used this ability to manipulate past events. By doing so, however, they have created multiple eccentric world lines, one of which is our own. Professor Fate, meanwhile, has found himself thrust into the position of informant for these so-called timeline engineers. The following posts and emails were sent by an individual who claims to be native to a world line where the USA did not take part in World War II. There are some Montauk Project investigators such as Michael Ash who state that the Montauk Project had sent agents back in time to help Great Britain and America win the war against Germany. Could this current time-slash-world line be the result of time travel manipulation? Or, could it be that some of the agents working at Montauk who were affiliated with Germany, went back in time and helped Germany to win the war, essentially creating another worldliness? Whatever the case, Listen on and form your own conclusions. Could the creation of multiple timelines by temporal manipulation on the part of the Montauk projects lead to some kind of unraveling of the linear third dimension itself, perhaps around the year 2012 as some have suggested? The individual source of this information will be identified only as Professor Fate. Date, WED, March 17, 1999. Thank you for your gracious if overwhelming reply. I can only hope that I have the intellectual stamina to see coordinate the expression of my thoughts as well as you have deployed yours. Because of other demands I will be obliged to respond to your email in a piecemeal fashion, but eventually I will address, in however a circuitous route, as many of the topics as I can. The paucity in my personal experience of different world lines makes me incapable of attributing the primacy of origin or determination to one as opposed to another. Indeed as I am increasingly coming to suspect, that may be ultimately a meaningless question. Although, by circumscribing one set of references, a diligent observer could discern a genealogy. Any person who has transposed from their aboriginal world line to an alternative can automatically, by virtue of their discrepant nature, evaluate the comparative stability or solidity of the two. At least, this is my vouchsafed experience. This natural talent or expertise is perhaps not germane to, and probably obfuscates, any attempt to ascertain a family tree. Date, Wed, March 17, 1999 To continue Another aptitude that is acquired by a transposer is a psychic sensitivity which I call, and this is possibly a misnomer, chronopathy, the ability to detect locales where there is a temporal discontinuity. This has a variety of formats. What might be indicated is a site of unusual temporal integrity or intensity in comparison to its surroundings. Or a configuration that is peculiarly related to a counterpart on another time-slash-world line, and thus has a higher potential to facilitate a physical transfer between the two tracks. There are doubtlessly other determinations which can be gleaned and a superintending gestalt that I do not yet understand. In my experience, an overcast day is the most conducive condition or prerequisite for reliable and repeated observations, but, on the other hand, the absence of sunlight, that is to say, the evening obliterates any sensitivity. On one or two occasions I have discovered in the full bore of unfiltered sunlight one of these outstanding sights or overlaps. Whether this was due to a unique emanation or an unusual degree of discrimination on my part, or some other variable or combination of the aforementioned, I cannot say. This year I intend to begin a cartographical record of these areas. Lastly, alas, I must acknowledge that in my case I can only espy those emplacements that are synchronized, in whatever manner or quality, with my own world line. 
as to whether this reveals an intrusion of one domain upon the other, or a natural or artificial network of gateways, I do not know. Although I am prone to rampages of speculation, about this entire matter I am trying to be as circumspect as possible. Soon. Date, Thursday, March 18, 1999. Deleting, for the sake of narrative simplicity, my own intricate and confusing story, that will have to be recounted later, let me expatiate upon my home world line. It is 25 years behind this timeline. Perhaps the most glaring departure between the two is that the United States never participated in the Second World War. After the conquest of metropolitan France by Germany, and Italy, the British Empire signed an armistice and subsequent peace treaty with the Axis powers. A matter has occurred which unfortunately obliges me to curtail the account very prematurely. I will resume as soon as I can. Thanks for your patience. Date, Thursday, March 18, 1999. The provisions of the settlement were actually quite lenient. There was to be no occupation and the British army was promptly repatriated, there was no Dunkirk the war party in the parliament toppled when the BEF was bagged in France and in return for German guidance in British foreign, and to a lesser degree, domestic, policy and the contribution of a modest expeditionary force, mainly naval, to the great anti-Bolshevik crusade, Hitler, to the extreme annoyance of the Italians, personally guaranteed the integrity of the British Empire, a point not lost on the Japanese either. Although Hitler was very partial to Mussolini as an individual, the German military established a far more intimate relationship with the English than they ever desired to with their ostensible Italian allies. Nevertheless, the remnants of the war party, in the guise of a British first movement, was able to survive, after a fashion, as the loyal parliamentary opposition. Punctuated with violence, the socialist and labor coalition was suppressed, intimidated, co-opted, or bought off. They remain to this day however the source of the English resistance, by way of comparison, they are to the United Kingdom what the Basques are to contemporary Spain in this world line. WW2 was much less damaging to Britain than was the case here. A number of nations, especially Australia and New Zealand, were more pro-empire than even the English. South Africa became the fascist consciences of Great Britain, while Canada became the haven for the disloyal albeit ineffectual, opposition. India remained the jewel in the crown, but the subcontinent was a much more fractious place than it was in the pre-war period. This took longer than I anticipated. It's time for me to move along again. More lately. Date, Friday, March 19, 1999. Before I continue my historical background briefing tomorrow, let me quickly answer a few of your latest questions. If you regard any of my information or conjectures meritorious enough, then by all means post whatever you wish. On my world line, during the war many thousands of Jews were surreptitiously ransomed by concerned parties in the Western Hemisphere. Otherwise, they and others were gradually exhausted as slave labor. It was the maw of inhuman economics that consumed their lives rather than occultist monomania. From my 15-year research effort I have concluded that whereas the Germans may have lost the war on this world, the Nazis and their allies in the United States definitely won. Although I learned in 1974 how to physically transfer myself back to my aboriginal world line, an opportunity of which I fortunately did not avail myself, agents there grafted my consciousness upon a duplicate in this world. A simply made remark that plasters over a great many stumbling blocks of detail. I am in general agreement concerning your assertion that dreams can be a medium of insertion or transference. But if I may use myself once again as a totally unrepresentative statistical sample, in my experience, which I have undergone only a few times, it is a trans state even deeper than the usual oniric condition that actually propels one into an authentic alternative world. One would realize that you have transposed if, in your dream, all of your senses, self-awareness and perhaps most importantly critical reflectiveness are as active as they are when you are awake. Ordinarily, these faculties are non-existent, suppressed, or diminished in the dream state. In any case, 
when an immigrant returns their consciousness to their home world line they experience an ineffable resynchronization or aptness that throws into glaring relief how unreal their other life has been. Friday, March 19, 1999 As if attempting to subdue China wasn't a sufficient strain upon Japan's resources, beginning in May 1939 they found themselves in an ever-expanding war with the Soviet Union. Being so preoccupied on the mainland of Asia the Japanese Empire couldn't even seriously entertain a general offense against the United States or even the vestigial European colonial powers, particularly since they were now the clients of Germany. With Britain and Japan thus removed as instigators, the interventionist cause collapsed in America. Even after the invasions of the Soviet Union the consensus of the citizenry was, it's far away, they might all kill each other off, what about us? A degree of artificial prosperity was generated by the expansion of the armed forces, less than undertaken by your country during WW2, but stupendous compared to the pre-war levels of either world line, and more decisively by the elaboration of the armaments industry. The dominant isolationist faction accepted the conversion of the United States into Fortress America, and the internationalists had to be content with arranging for the hemispheric defense. Underscore 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 Date, Friday, March 19, 1999 It wasn't until approximately 1960 that the United States was able to surmount the pitfalls created by the Great Depression. We did not enjoy the unique and tremendous economic advantages that allowed the America of this world line to so spectacularly flourish. There was little transfer of hard assets principally undertaken by Great Britain in your timeline, to our coffers. There was no post-war worldwide captive market for our exports and investments. And there was no returning throng of potential consumers prepared to revitalize the domestic economy. Consider the ramifications of that last absent phenomenon. We didn't have a baby boom. There was no demographic displacement to the suburbs, of course there was some inevitable expansion in that direction. On the other hand, we too have an interstate highway system and one completed earlier than yours, facilitates troop movements you know. Our material quality of life would seem spartan, somewhat shabby, and rather technologically unsophisticated to you, even allowing for the 25-year discrepancy in our temporal velocities, but a preservationist would regard my US of A as a paradise. Date, Sat, March 20, 1999 I can quickly reply to two of your previous questions before I describe contemporary conditions on my world line. America participated in WWI as it did in your history. And I have no idea if JFK was assassinated or even if he entered politics. My knowledge of personalities is non-existent. I have a conjecture as to why that is the case, but I must cogitate upon it further before I will hazard a thesis. Currently my world line has dire expectations for its future. Imagine your own world's Cold War at its most truculent with the equivalent of a Cuban Missile Crisis occurring two of three times a year. Nerves are frazzled beneath the surface of denial. The final war is expected if not tomorrow or even the day after, then someday and soon. At least in the United States, people eagerly, if not desperately, lose themselves in the intricacies of ordinary life. Let me set the international scene. After the conquest of European Russia, the gruesome colonization of their frontier the Ostmark, the giddiness of recasting the architectural face of Greater Germany, the self-indulgence abetted by plunder and triumph, and the glorification of the fatherland not experienced since 1871, the Third Reich is obviously the preeminent, if not predominant, world power. And although the technocrats believe the future for Germany is in continuing its monopoly of space exploration and colonization, the latest generation of occultism ideologues are on the verge of successfully promoting a renewal of war in order to acquire the sacred Aryan homeland of Central Asia. Date, Monday, March 22, 1999 To continue and I hope complete my most generalized recounting of the international situation on my world line. India has become a running sore for Great Britain. Very little of the Indian Army would be available for overseas deployment and that otherwise large military assets is just about the only enticement for the British to remain. 
everyone expects them to abandon the subcontinent soon and let, greater, India return to its pre-conquest balkanized condition. Canada is independent in all but name, and, of course, a somewhat dismembered France, at the connivance of the Germans, is attempting with considerable success to incite the secessionist sentiments of Quebec. Justifiably, the empire has become increasing paranoid about Japan. The new Roman Empire of Italy has settled, or sunk, into quiescence. Of all the former Axis powers, Japan suffered the greatest losses, expenditure of capital, and realized the least from its victory. The Japanese fought the Soviet Union the longest and with the least success. The spoils of Siberia have not been extracted as thoroughly as they might because of the undercapitalized Japanese economic infrastructure. Although as an outlet for the excess population from the home islands, the northern frontier zone has provided one of the few untarnished consequences of victory. China has been subdued but in its subjection has become a tremendous burden for Japan to control. Perhaps in reaction to a less than satisfactory, especially compared to Germany, post-war recovery and as development of pre-war sociological trends, the Japanese have become even more hysterical in their racial chauvinism than even the Nazis. The ruling class has immersed itself in a nihilistic spiritual creed. Think of a North Korea in command of the manpower and potential wealth of the Far East and you will have an image of the condition that obtains in contemporary Japan. It is widely assumed that the British Empire in the Pacific will be their first target, followed by the Americans. One more installment should do it. With best regards, Professor Fate. Date, Monday, March 22, 1999. America is a garrison state, it has ruthlessly, if not always nakedly, enforced its hegemony of the Western Hemisphere. The chronic and occasionally acute demands of national security have provoked restiveness in a portion of the public, but for many Americans this is the first era of relative affluence they have enjoyed since the fabled 1920s and so they're willing to overlook the fact that the United States is a crypto-fascist country. Along this world line Roswell evidently never happened and thus Colonel Corso, or his counterpart, didn't insinuate retro-engineered alien technology into our commercial infrastructure. The subsequent social revolution that this world line underwent never occurred on my home world. Although the sophistication of our computers is many technical generations behind yours, my America is our world's leader in the development of electronic calculators. A frantic Great Britain has at last succeeded in prying the United States loose from its official foreign policy of autarkic isolationism. Of course we regard South America and the rest of North America as our economic and political preserve and there has been for 50 years a tight, if unacknowledged, collusion between the plutocracies of Germany and the USA. There is a defector's alliance between the British Empire and America to repel the impending Japanese onslaught. Germany is expected to opportunistically revive its drive to the east bringing it on a collision course with the Empire of Nippon. However oblique the motives and goals of the Allies may be they have the power to defeat Japan. But defeat isn't enough. Japan is sufficiently strong to be a vortex capable of dragging everyone else down. And on my world line there will be no hesitation about depleting the super weapons in every combatant's arsenal. I have now at last finished conveying the highlights of my home world's modern history and contemporary situation. I apologize for any pedantry but without providing some background my own story is incomprehensible. As always, with best regards, Professor Fate. Date, Monday, March 22, 1999. If one must identify a single divergence tangent, a descriptive model that I am increasingly coming to regard as a distorting oversimplification, between our world lines, it would be the Japanese reaction to the humiliating defeat inflicted upon them by the Soviet Union in the Battle of Kalkin Gol or the No Moen incident that concluded on 31 August 1939. I just don't know if there was a Montauk project or even a Philadelphia experiment on my world line. It is obvious to me however that some party or parties in that United States has the power to implant my psyche into this world line and to communicate with me as required. I was dispatched on a mission and I can only presume, let me reiterate, presume that I wasn't sent here alone. I'm just the tip of a very long tail. 
Perhaps my remarks concerning the issue of the primacy and derivativeness of world lines was elliptical, too offhanded, or so embedded textually as to be understandably overlooked. I never intended to imply that I regarded my home world as the original, in fact, I have come to consider the question of which time slash world line was the first as a meaningless one. However, for reasons previously mentioned, I have ascertained that this world line, compared to my own, the only basis of comparison I have, is profoundly far-fetched and volatile. Insofar as I can determine, if one must describe a single initial divergence, another practice about which I have become highly dubious, it would be the success in your history of the D. Kelly Enochian workings, 1582-87. This instability has been subsequently reinforced by the passing of the Dark Satellite, 1881, the Montauk Project, insert your own dates, the detonation of a terological bomb by the U.S., 1993, and God knows what else. As for being a multiverse crossroads, whatever this world line was originally, it sure is one now. If I can keep up, more latter and best regards, Professor Fate. Date, Friday, March 26, 1999. We certainly have our nuclear arsenals, and the United States possesses a Maginot line of particle beam towers which I suspect is what has principally deterred Germany from attacking America. I am unaware of a Bermuda Triangle or its counterparts on my world. This is an expression of my ignorance nothing else is implied. Date, Sun, March 28, 1999 The question of doubles is a vexing one. Although I am very inclined to answer no, I feel that if I did so an important qualification or aspect would be swept under the rug. I'm sorry that I don't have a facile reply, but this is another mystery about my situation which perplexes me. No PBS or cable, but our commercial networks are more numerous. The broadcasting emphasis is upon local and national niche programming much as it was in the early 50s on this world line. In content, it's never moved too far away from its foundation in radio. A rut I guess, however we never had to wait for the latest programming fad to recede either. By the way, the movie studios received an antitrust exemption, it was in the national interest to have that propaganda mill undisturbed, and so the movie industry never underwent the wrenching restructuring that here it suffered through for 30 years. In so far as I can ascertain, our industrial style and the pace of alteration is extremely modest or conservative compared to flurry of change and temporary domination of a given fashion that we experience. On my world line, the American civilian economy, although robust, just doesn't have the elasticity and self-indulgent abundance that is so staggering on your world. Sincerely, Professor Fate. Date, Wed, March 31, 1999. Our most advanced American cars are lower, wider, and more curvaceous than those with which we are familiar. The new Beetle is very reminiscent of our automobile designs. We didn't have to endure fins, compact cars, or Japanese imports. In apparel, societal strictures have prevented the flood of informality that has inundated the costuming here. The uniforms of subcultures, goth, gangster, etc., that have proliferated in this America are insofar as they exist at all, marginal and when they surface regarded with suspicion by the mainstream culture. What we know as casual dress is about as casual as it gets. Professor Fate Date, Thursday, April 1, 1999 I have previously alluded to the fact that on my world line there is a substantial collaboration between the American plutocracy and the technocratic faction of the German ruling class. I am, of course, not privy to the intimate particulars of this arrangement. Ironically, it was probably this alliance that forestalled fatal conflict between the Third Reich and the United States. So your intuition Alan is quite correct. Date, Thursday, April 1, 1999 To reiterate, the most valuable resource possessed by this planet, the one which attracts in ever-increasing numbers visitors from throughout the multiverse, is its metaphysical and empirical eccentricity. The strain of improbability, indigenous to all world lines, is unusually and significantly pronounced in this one. 
Activities can be undertaken here that are prohibitively difficult on the operator's home world, discoveries, inventions, experiments, etc., which, if possible at all, would require exorbitant time and labor to even attempt on another more state world can be performed on this planet, at this time, with comparative ease. Unfortunately, every such act, and indeed the insertion of the alien perpetrator himself, increases the instability of this world line. Improbabilities compound themselves until, if you will, the speculative bull market crashes. I would be surprised if there weren't numerous native-born humans who aren't exploiting this condition as well. Whatever else obtains that would contribute to the explanation of this planet's current condition, this is the situation as I understand, and have been given to understand, it to be. Professor Fate Date, Monday, April 5, 1999 Regrettably, I am unable to answer the vast majority of your questions and the rest only in a generality. For example, organized religion in my America still has an elaborate and intimate community or neighborhood presence generally throughout the country. Remember, the 60s never happened on my world, and the social alterations which happened so precipitously and irresistibly here have proceeded, shall we say, more sedately or diffidently from where I come. But as to the details of how our scriptures differ from yours, I have no idea. I presume or take for granted that until the divergence in 1939 the minutiae of daily life were identical on both worlds. This is my problem, well, one of them something more substantial than my consciousness but, I presume once again, as usual, something less encompassing than my soul was transferred involuntarily from my aboriginal world to this one. This happened when I was six years old, on both worlds. I first became aware of my dislocation when I was eight years of age, on this world line of course. How much does a six-year-old remember about anything? How much can anyone 46 years later reliably remember of one's infancy? And how much survived the abolition I underwent? Besides, I am now a fully integrated personality. The only direct knowledge I have of my home world has been gleaned from those few occasions when my astral body has been retrieved by my superiors in order to reinforce my conditioning, it isn't my intention to convey the impression that this is a sinister procedure, the grief engendered by ontological nostalgia is more than sufficiently persuasive in cementing one's attention. The historical information that I have imparted devolves from a briefing that those responsible for my condition and mission superimposed upon me, again, as reinforcement. So my knowledge is maddeningly general and abstract on the one hand, and overly particular but severely constrained on the other. So, although I will try to be as forthcoming as possible, I hope you will appreciate my limitations. With the very best of regards. Professor Fate. Note, the following post was in response to claims made by Alex Collier that the Germans created a time-slash-space rift in 1931 as a result of time travel experimentation, allowing the greys to enter our reality from the future of an earlier time-slash-world and begin to engage in temporal manipulation along this world line, Alan. Date, Wed, April 14, 1999, 35 minutes and 56 seconds-0500, CDT. Okay, I'm not quite sure if I am most directly addressing Alan or Alex, but in any case. When I first read this post I a priori dismissed the possibility raised within. However upon reflection, my initial reaction was prejudiced and hasty. If the Germans are experimenting with time machines upon my world line, and I have no indication that they are, but there is also no reason for me to be privy to such machinations, I couldn't resist the pun. I imagine that the means of acquiring temporal technology was as follows. Presuming that the Germans, whoever that might really be, for example, instead of the Nazis equivalent of the Manhattan Project, it could be the undertaking of an isolated faction, are aware of this world line and can also insert their agents into it, at some junction along the post-1931 timeline of this Earth, they contact those Germans engaged in chrononautical research. Because, as I have previously posted, your world line is much more susceptible to paranormal exploitation the possibility of succeeding in such experiments is significantly greater and easier. After learning all they can, 
these hypothetical agents are then extracted and returned to my home line, and the mischief begins anew. Elements of this scenario could be altered for it to be equally plausible, but this version seems to be the most sensible to me. However, let me reiterate, I know of no evidence to justify its supposition. Quite frankly, although I must begrudgingly intellectually concede the possibility described in your post, emotionally I don't want to have anything to do with it. But that's a bad reflection upon me, not you. Professor Fate Date, Friday, April 23, 1999 Dear Alan and ETL Regrettably, my specific knowledge of my home line depends upon a collage of childhood memories, casual reobservation, attuned inferences, and the statements of my superiors. I am unable, therefore, to reply directly to your inquiry, but obliquely I can say this, it is my impression slash understanding that most other world lines, are above all else, concerned with maintaining their own stability, their own humdrum persistence and progression, if you will. This world line, and others like it, is regarded as a fascinating, useful, and horrible example of what happens when temporal slash ontological manipulation escalates. Date, Wed, April 28, 1999 Since the discussion of parallel worlds, including most of the concepts and terminology associated with this topic, originated in the popular culture of science fiction and comic books, I thought I should bring this to your attention. The role-playing company TSR for its game Alternet has published a supplement entitled Tangents. It is a source book which describes in considerable detail their theory of alternate worlds and the technology used to travel from one world line to another. Of course, most of the material is only pertinent to and phrased in terms of the game system, nevertheless, some of you might find the conjectures contained therein to be stimulating and useful. Best regards. Professor Fate. Date, Wed, June 9, 1999 Dear Alan, friends, and lurkers My apologies for the tardiness of my reply to the question you posed on the 18th of last month, but I have been recovering from a nasty spot of pneumonia. My overseers, as you have felicitously characterized them, treat me as a more or less involuntary agent, and thus, I can only make informed inferences about their nature and purpose. I have been told that the American government will be the beneficiary of the information that I accrue upon this world. From this I surmise that they are, to some degree at least, working for the government in some intelligence gathering and slash or military capacity. Their purview seems to be circumscribed to these areas of interest and whatever I, and others sent from my original world line, Glean will be dedicated to the impending war effort against the Germanic Empire which threatens the other world line. Alan. They may have the know-how to be a quantum police force. But insofar as I can tell, they have no motivation or inclination to behave as such. With best regards. Professor Fate. Note, the following are more recent posts from Professor Fate, to the members of a time travel email list years ago. Subject, Professor Fate. From. Date, Monday July 31st. 2000, 11.39 a.m. Subject, Re, Inquiries was Re, Al Bielik Video. To all that this may concern. I haven't, until about five minutes ago, taken the time to read the messages posted on this forum for the last two days. I believe that Joni is, with gracious reticence, referring to me as the one who has asserted that I am a transplant from an alternate Earth. It was not my intention, rather my inattention, to artificially create suspense concerning when or if I would reveal my identity. If Mr. Hamilton and the others who have expressed interest in my story, for which, honesty in advertising compels me to admit I have not an iota of evidence, would consult the archives of this list, perhaps the list master could be of assistance, many of their inquiries should be addressed, if not, I think, cross your fingers. I have my primary statement on file and could arrange to reproduce it here for general edification, or entertainment, as the case may be. There is not much more that I currently have to add to the aforementioned archived report except to say, that based upon a certain series of disclosures which have been tendered to me in the last year, I am becoming persuaded that this earth may have more exiles, 
agents, or what have you from alternative Earths walking around than I have hitherto believed. If I can be of any assistance in providing further elucidation about my own situation or this topic in general I am at your disposal. Best regards. Professor Fate. Dear Mr. Hamilton. As I read your recent message I couldn't remember posting such interesting material, and then it occurred to me that perhaps you are alluding to Mr. Walton's, and may he soon rejoin us, remarks which became entangled with my own, this is understandable since my supplementary elaborations appeared in a dialogue with the estimable Mr. Walton. Nevertheless, although we will have to await his exposition of the time war and the fifth dimension, I can address your other inquiries. Once again, I shall try to clarify a misunderstanding which hitherto I have never been able to correct, to the best of my knowledge I never claimed that my Earth was the prototype indeed, I recall declaiming, perhaps a mite too dismissively or at least testily, that such a search is impossible and pointless. However, I did assert that from my perspective this Earth is an artificially or unnaturally deviated counterpart in comparison to, if you will, the set of natural permutations. I of course, can reasonably be accused of special pleading but that is the situation as understand it to be. Chronologically, my Earth is about a quarter of century behind this one, technologically, with a number of exceptions, perhaps 40 years behind yours well, ours and in its culture generally between 40 and 50. If you have found it, the particulars are dealt with in my position paper. Although I am hesitant to employ terminology gleaned from pop culture, simply because the allegorical correspondences begin to break down rather quickly and it becomes, in any case, a narrow and inhibiting framework for discussion, loved the movie though, and Dark City is a must-see, let me just baldly state that as a principle I regard the astral domain as the matrix, although with no imputation of malevolent neo-gnostic deception and oppressiveness, and in its fundamental function the equivalent of the state vector of quantum physics. And from this, he said in his best imitation of Orson Welles as the shadow, many portentous consequences follow. Well, I hope some of this helps. Best regards. Professor Fate. Woman complained about his lingo superfluous, Judith, never, convoluted, so a number of my friends say. Okay, at the risk of stepping into the same bear trap that I kept telling myself to avoid. Let me try this. The astral domain is the matrix, the archetypal program that can be reprogrammed to project any given simulation of reality into the minds of its percipients. My Earth, our Earth, an Earth where Mickey Mouse rules the world, and all the other conceivable and inconceivable, possible and impossible Earths are specific concrete variations of this astral software. Now left to itself this entire process proceeds according to natural metaphysical laws, or so metaphysicians and theologians reassure us. But the human, inhuman, and non-human will can, according to the same sources, intervene and alter the code. This can amount to a violation of, a temporary suspension of, or if he or she or it is really good, the reconstitution of natural physical laws. When this happens it's called magic, divine intervention, montauk, and a thousand and one other things, depending on the originating agent, s, or agency, or as a contemporary scientist might say, and as the relatively in these circles conservative physicist Evan H. Walker did say, here comes the jargon highly sustained willpower results in the collapse of the state vector on the macroscopic scale at an extremely improbable level. Now, if you have one or more parties in command of the psychological technology, in want of a better phrase, on this world or any other, necessary to so reorder the reality of any given group of sentient you don't have so much, as Mr. Walton says, time wars, as reality wars. That, in a nutshell perhaps one with a very thick covering and a very small nut is why we are experiencing the real battlefield Earth. Okay, any better? Best regards. Professor Fate. Dear Maverick. Because you were the first to submit a daunting list of questions to I shall address this response to you, although of course all who have expressed interest in my statements are being kept in mind, and yes Judith I do speak like this, sometimes to the consternation of my friends I guess I am a hopeless captive of a 19th century literary temperament. 
I see that Starfire Tor also has some coordinated inquiries, and if I may ask for his indulgence, I will try to answer his at the soonest available opportunity. My place of business is starting to move this week, wonderfully coinciding with a quarter of the staff leaving for vacation so I am suddenly having to cover the shifts of a number of other workers and so I'm afraid my stamina is being a bit overtaxed. So my apologies to all if my replies are even less satisfactory than usual. A prefatory note, I'm afraid that drove Mr. Walton to a state of disappointment and exasperation, if not aggravation, when I attempted to answer his questions. Regretfully, and no one feels this more keenly than I do, any elucidation of mine is severely constrained by the amount of information that I can bring to bear on the questions mustered by the list members. Irrespective of whether or not my assertions are judged to be self-delusional, if not indicative of a psychotic fugue, a hoax, a egomaniacal campaign to stimulate attention, or what have you, my storehouse of facts or information is almost devoid of goods, and I cannot confabulate anything beyond that limitation. I will try to, as thoroughly as I can, answer any questions but the data you seek just may not be available to me. This is why I contacted Mr. Walton in the first place and joined this list, i.e., in the hope that in the recounting of someone else's story I might find something to illuminate the very dark corners of my own. So if my responses seem to be unresponsive, vague, abstract, mere generalities, I can only express my regret for having falsely inflating your expectations and then wasting your time. I infer from the context of my experience that my superiors, and I place the italic marks around that word to indicate my ironic and very ambivalent attitude towards them, are a quasi-government group in my home world America. By this I mean they are, as best as I can judge, either a deep black ops agency deliberately lost in the bureaucratic paperwork, or an independent association with intimate one-way, them to it, ties to the government. It is my impression that the latter is closer to the truth. Our communication is entirely initiated from their end. On those rare occasions when it has occurred the medium of transmission has been my dream state. Now, I don't have to be psychic to predict what may now be the reaction of the more skeptical among you. Believe me, if I was in your position my head would be shaking as well and what follows would be classified as case closed. But, in order to preserve the integrity of my experience and the feasibility of my claims let me, at this time, hope that this clarification is sufficient to offset the understandable qualms one or more of you may be having about the bother of reading further. When I have these episodes the panoply of my senses are engaged, very much unlike the ordinary dream state, at least mine, and indeed, at a pitch of lucidity and vivacity greater than my waking state. This condition is exclusively extant during these times. It is as if, and this is how I interpret it or choose to interpret it, I am returning to the psychophysical matrix to which I was aboriginally attuned and to which I am briefly reintegrated. It's a peculiar form of a heightened state of consciousness. Without further flailing about in, what must shortly become for all of you, a tedious attempt to describe this singular state, let me just conclude by saying that its nature is such as to throw it into contrast with every other state of consciousness that I ordinarily experience. So, unless I am dealing with an eccentric neurological disorder a possibility which I must acknowledge even if I vehemently reject it the phenomenal validity is vouchsafed for me because of the aforementioned comparisons which I can tabulate. Well, as Judith, my stylistic conscience, might point out I am becoming garrulous and here I haven't even finished answering your second question. I beseech your patience and I will resume soon. Best regards. Professor Fate. To resume. It would be helpful if I replied to your questions Maverick in the order given, literacy what a concept IVE got to try it some time. I jumped from inquiry number one to three. I will try to be more attentive in the future. Most specifically, my sponsors, if you will, want me to discover what methods have been developed on this fraternal earth, if I may expropriate C.D. Hoyt's most felicitous characterization kudos, to biologically enhance the human body slash mind to superhuman levels. Or to render it another way, to deliberately punctuate Stephen Gould's evolutionary equilibrium. 
If Maverick you have been able to download my historical overview I think you would join me in concluding that they wish to apply whatever I have gleaned to improving the military capabilities of their America. Frankly, I don't begrudge them this at all. More soon, and I won't be reading any more posts on this list until I answer your questions, otherwise I will be spinning off on so many digressions that I'll never get back. And then on to Starfire Tour. If you and he have taken the time and effort to solicit my responses, however inadequate and unsatisfying they may be, the least I can do is to stay focused on one compendium at a time. Oh, and best regards. Professor Fate. Dear Maverick and all. At the risk of, as usual, leaving myself hanging from an epistolary thread, let me slip in a few remarks before I go to work. The contact in my sleep might be more exactly described as an extraction. I believe, and there might be a more accurate explanation of this phenomenon but this is the one which makes the most sense to me, that a very deeply embedded hypnotic program is stimulated by my superiors on these occasions which enables them to pull out the self that originated on my fraternal earth, realign its frequency of being so that it conforms to the resonance of their reality, and then communicate whatever it is they wish to impart. Presumably the process is then reversed and my aboriginal self is then reinserted or allowed to flow back into the host my doppelganger on this world. That is why I am sympathetic towards and prejudiced in favor of at least some of Al Bielik's assertions, Mr. Hamilton's disquietude about his account notwithstanding, especially those concerning the soul grafting, my phrase not his, and probably a poor one, which he and others have had performed upon them. Well. I'm up against the unyielding clock and I'm off for the day. I wish, oh do I dearly wish, I could be more exact and detailed in my rendition Maverick but this is about the best I can do. Maybe when I take on your further questions I can give a more satisfactory reply. Best regards. Professor Fate. Good morning Maverick and whomever else is still slogging through this with me. To provisionally conclude my response to your question about the communication pathway, let me hasten to add that my reversions to my home world are hardly frequent or periodic. In my entire life I have only been returned three times, although on the first occasion, the episode was protracted over several weeks. However, I have, again, technically in a dream state, subconsciously projected myself into, or been supinely attracted by the gravitational pull of, or whatever, my fraternal planet. The second time I was withdrawn by my superiors I was admonished that such a spontaneous, involuntary or surreptitious snapping back was very reckless and hazardous, to me, to the mission, to them, to the space-time equilibrium I don't know, as usual, I was told as little as necessary, and not to do it again for whatever reason I haven't. This might be the right place to interpolate the sequence of the procedure whereby I arrived on the world. On my fraternal earth I was an adult, and no, I don't remember any personal details when I have made an unauthorized return I seem to be incessantly touring my home city a rough analogue to the one I live in here I think in an attempt to touch base with something tangible, familiar, in the hope of recovering some personal information from that period of my life, that personality was distilled and regressed to the age of six, this is about to become even more bizarre, inconsistent, and demented sounding but this is what they told me. I was then projected into, or grafted upon, insert your own preferred designation, the being of my doppelganger, who was approximately the same age, I can verify this because I acutely recall the exact instant literally when I realized, at the age of eight, that I wasn't from this world and that something was very askew, I don't know if the epiphany coincided with the introduction of my base or previous personality or if that fact had taken that long to percolate to the top of, my consciousness. Then I was informed that when I obtained the information they sought I would be extracted, rejoined with my six-year-old self, although with the intellectual maturity of a ten-year-old, I suppose due to the subconscious presence of the lifetime experiences of two adults, allowed to naturally age to about the age of fourteen and then debriefed and my package retrieved. Sounds stupid, doesn't it? And as for all those loose ends, I have absolutely no idea what happens to them or how to reconcile the multiple paradoxes. I am equally ignorant concerning the instrumental details of how all this is done, or why it is, or has to be, done that way. 
As I have said before, I am the very tip of a very long tail, so my perspective isn't the most panoramic. Best regards. Professor Fate. Dear Maverick, and all whose further inquiries and comments I hope to address in order of appearance before the expiration of the decade. Apropos your recommendation of the term aberrant. As I've indicated, upon reading C. D. Hoyt's characterization, Fraternal World, I have adopted his usage in lieu of the one you proposed. Nevertheless, your own coinage is an especially apt description of this Earth's categorical status, and if I might, without sowing terminological confusion, I would like to reserve for potential application the adjective aberrant for worlds, I hope few in number, that can be so classified. Apparently, I am indeed asserting that these aberrant worlds, in your sense, are inhabited by soul-filled entities, just as the real, world does. Of course, although I have had recourse to this designation myself, its presence in this conversation makes me uncomfortable, simply because so many sects, denominations, philosophers and spiritual traditions have so many differing definitions of this ontological component the existence of which is for so many people, in any case, hypothetical at best. But the barn door was imprudently opened by me, so. When you asked, what is the interface that allows for the detection of and the connection to targeted souls to fuse, I am moved to clarify the entire context of this issue. All of the material dealt with by me in that post concerns a secret society on this world. The last time I was summoned home I had a very anomalous encounter with my superiors. On this unique occasion, the discussion had nothing to do with my standing mission. I was shown a film, accompanied by a briefing, the sources of the content of that post, and told to garner as much additional information as rapidly as possible. I inferred that another agent or agents furnished them initially with what data they possessed because the topic was a surprise to me. I surmised that they were very disturbed by the scope and activities of this fraternity because of its potential to destabilize the existential adamancy of their own world. Perhaps they also are trepidations about the competitive prowess of this group. I threw out what they knew in the hope that someone could fill in a blank there, add a detail here, etc. Nothing came of it, and to me it was just another job, and a digressive one at that. But I must acknowledge, in my judgment, their acute concern is justified. Are your superiors using souls, in the aberrant world, to restructure the matrix in the aberrant world, the real world? I'm sorry but I cannot begin to answer that question. I doubt if any conjecture on my part, which you weren't soliciting anyway, would be much more insightful than your own. More soon and with best regards. Professor Fate. Hello List Members. Please identify and expand. Only through specifics can we share a useful communication. Maverick was so pushy he repeated this throughout his entire grilling of Professor he was so specific he got kicked off Dragon Slayers. And if they were to be had they would be yours. The only meager addition, a clarification actually, is that this secret society has franchises, if I can be excused the flippancy, at the time of the original post, on four fraternal worlds including this earth where it apparently originated. I would presume, given what information I did receive, imparted to me with unusual thoroughness, that in the interim they have considerably expanded. This briefing was the last, or latest, contact I have had with my home world. As the perspicacious have noticed, there is a very messy issue of differing temporal flow rates, so if my assumption is factually correct, my sponsors may have an altogether different perspective. I can only reiterate that, at the time, it was sudden and very apprehensive development. Well Maverick, in the absence of an autobiography, that's the rest of the story insofar as your, initial, list of questions is concerned. Perhaps contained therein something of value or interest was gleaned by you and the others. All complaints are to be directed to parties unknown on a world far far away. I will now return to the message board and reply, in rotation to any further inquiries submitted by the list members. Thank you all for your courteous interest and I hope I didn't find my way into too many kill files. Best regards. Professor Fate. Well Starfire, they have never used the internet to communicate with me, 
probably because the internet, PCs, and even web TV have not, I suppose, even been imagined on my home world. No Roswell, no Corso, no transistors, nifty death ray citadels though. But if you will read the last chapter of The Electric Connection, its effects on mind and body by Michael Shalley's I think you will discover some germane, albeit disquieting, observations on the topic of what can use the internet to initiate communication. I trust that I have been able to elaborate upon, if not satisfactorily answer, a number of your subsequent questions. As to whether or not I believe that, magic and the occult sciences play a real role in the working of the Matrix, I most emphatically do, especially here. To the best of my knowledge, and this only refers to the research that I have conducted, only the works of John Bennett bear some relevance to the issue of the historical origins of this secret society, I am reasonably confident in asserting that the Freemasons, Illuminati, etc. are not involved. Their objectives, as claimed by themselves or by their detractors, and methodologies don't seem to be pertinent. Best regards. Professor Fate. Dear Maverick. Just let take a moment to reassure you that I am not a member of the Belic Clack. Unlike Mr. Hamilton, or perhaps yourself, I do not have the competence, nor frankly, the inclination, to examine the veracity of his claims. His personal account, nor even his rendition of the P.E. slash Montauk affair, sounds like an old man from UNCLE episode, has any intrinsic bearing upon my own experiences. To paraphrase what you said, just because one can usefully segregate discrete elements from the accounts of the Montauk 3, or is it 4 now, doesn't compel one to endorse the remainder. If posterity confirms his version of events, then good for him, if not, then I trust he realized he couldn't take it with him. Certain aspects of his story resonate with me but it is those similarities and not necessarily the man himself which arouses my attention. Best regards. Professor Fate. Dear Maverick. My apologies for the tardiness of my replies, and I am afraid they will continue, for a while, to be sporadic, because of the relocation of my workplace I have recently been pulling down sometimes triple shifts and when I return home even turning on the internet seems to be an unbearable chore. In your message of 8 4 10 57 am, you postulated that there may have been episodes which I can no longer consciously retrieve. Insofar as the unilateral initiatives of my superiors are concerned, I don't think so, the ambience of the event is much too singular for me to forget one. However, it is possible, although I have tried to monitor these experiences as assiduously as I can, that I have forgotten one or more of my unauthorized returns. It also seems to me that the pseudo-physical process of retracting me to my home world is the only method available to those responsible, at least there has been no indication of any other means hitherto employed. And yet, I must admit that it would be reasonable to infer that they have some way to keep themselves apprised of my situation. Do you have a preference of worlds? To most baldly put it, at least subconsciously, the compulsion to return is the light motif of my life a fact about which I am both rueful and considerably ambivalent. Alas, I must shortly leave for work and I am unable to continue. I hope, upon my return this evening, I will be able to resume and reply at greater length. Best regards. Professor Fate. Dear Maverick. In your letter of 8 4 10 57 am you asked for a clarification of my relationship with those I have dubbed superiors and if I am implying a more specific subordination. Because they were responsible for my situation, imprinted and reinforced my motivation, and claimed to possess the means of restoring a facsimile of my aboriginal life, I have deemed them my superiors or sponsors. Nothing else is, knowingly, intended. In schematic terms, it may not be the most fitting but it seems subjectively the most apt designation. I really don't remember a single detail about my adult life on my home world, and I truly cannot imagine that any aspect of any of my vocations has the slightest concordance, other than the sherry coincidental and trivial, with any professional attainment upon my fraternal earth. I do however believe that my avocational interests have been substantially influenced by my subconscious re-education. 
You have asked me to untangle some of the sequential conundrums. When I was an adult on my home world that state of being was regressed to the person that I was, on the fraternal earth, at the age of six. This composite was then alloyed with my counterpart on this world, this had to have been done before my epiphany at the age of eight, now whether this was done one second or n years beforehand, I can't say. It is my impression that I no longer subsist as an adult on my home world indeed, if one could in synchronization observe both worlds at this moment I don't know what, if any, tangible presence I would have on my original earth. You are correct in your recapitulation of the sequence of temporal and biological relationships which I was told that would eventuate upon my restoration. Apparently, they'd planned to retrieve and terminate the mission. Has not yet reached the phase of implementation. I must concede that I am not unsympathetic to the reasonableness of situating my experience within the psychological model of abuse but it is not entirely satisfactory to me, after all, for example, a soldier's relationship to his superior officer can be justly so described but you must acknowledge there is an extenuating context that undermines the literal accuracy of such a characterization. Nevertheless, your words bear reflection on my part. Let me address the remaining portions of you thoughtful email in the near future. Best regards. Professor Fate. Dear Starfire Tor. I am in between business trips and as I was trying to swim against the tide of reading my messages before the heat death of the universe occurs I encountered yours. And to you as well I hope you will excuse my laggardness in replying. The reason why I wanted to draw your attention to The Electric Connection by Mitchell L. Shalley's was because in the last chapter he applies Rudolf Steiner's concept of the Ahriman principle to the nature of cybernetics. He asserts that whereas raw electricity is the substantial body of Ahriman, a necessary but adversarial spirit insofar as the evolution of the human species is concerned, the computer, and by implication, I suppose, our entire electromechanical infrastructure, it its functional body. As you might imagine he does not draw warm and fuzzy inferences from this supposition. Our computer network is demonically possessed, to imitate a headline writer for the World Weekly News. So, if your local library has a copy of this book, a perusal of the last chapter, although the entire book is worth one's attention, might lead you to some interesting conjectures about what forces or agencies can inhabit the Internet, other than the evils of spammers and trolls of course. I will respond to the other questions of your letter of the 8th as soon as I can. Best regards. Professor Fate. Dear Bruce. A few weeks ago, I received a new communication from my contacts, a woman and two men, on my aboriginal world slash timeline. I wish to take this occasion to impart for what it is worth the following information. I have, in those posts that the redoubtable Nikki recovered and consolidated several months ago, written of the alleged artificiality or unnaturalness of this world slash timeline. I have also commented upon the fecund susceptibility of this cosmos to existential erosion which manifests itself in, and is stimulated in turn by, literal paranormal phenomena. And how the resulting ontological contradictions or incompatibilities will eventually result in the dissolution of this world slash timeline. A perusal of the relevant digests will amplify upon and detail my remarks. Let me direct your attention to those archives. My handlers told me that what Werner Ving and others refer to as the singularity will trigger the aforementioned event. A bit of background before you all bring up your search engine of choice. In the early 90s, the science fiction writer, Werner expropriated a term from astrophysics and applied it to an impending and inexorable event. According to his and others' calculations, in the year 2035, although, in the opinion of the woman in the group, the year 2025, the ever-accelerating climb of the plotted curve of knowledge and technological implementation of those discoveries will become vertically ascendant. That point when the curve becomes perpendicular Ving called the singularity. At that juncture, the pace of change and innovation will become so rapid and unassimilable that the world as we knew it becomes unknowable and unpredictable. Although, believe it or not, there are groups, such as the transhumanists and the utopians, who salivate over this liberation from the fetters of history, I'm afraid the sociological implications are very dire. 
as any number of academic specialists in the sundry fields of personal and collective psychology can tell you, when an individual or group is under the pressure of the stress of unsuccessfully trying to adjust to a barrage of unanticipated changes, they tend to have a nervous breakdown. My liaisons believe we, on this world slash timeline, will be witnessing and slash or experiencing a catastrophic psychodemographic collapse which will powerfully intensify the aforementioned attrition of our existential stability. Now, let me hasten to clarify, they aren't asserting that one second after midnight on January 1, 2035, or whenever, the universe disappears in a puff of smoke and then the smoke disappears. It is one of those a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step sort of things. When the singularity occurs, the final irrevocable countdown starts. How long it take to reach zero is ours to guess. There is a further subtext to this phenomenon which I need to address later. I just thought that someone might want a heads up. Sincerely. Professor Fate. Stay paranoid my friends.